as a part of the series, we are honored to have Ms. Judy Allison Lee with us today. Uh, Judy is a co-chair at the International Trade Regulation and the Compliance Practice Group and a partner at Gibson Down. With expertise in export controls, CFIUS, OFAC, and more. Welcome, Judy. Thank you very much, Ella, and thank you everybody for um, coming today to talk about um, international trade controls and how they can affect companies such as yours in this very important sector of the US economy. So as Ella mentioned, we're going to be doing a very brief overview of three really important uh, parts of US law that have a, a, a very significant effect on companies that are operating in this sector. So um, again, what are these trade controls that we're going to be talking about and why should you care about them? Um, we're going to be talking about economic sanctions. Some people may have heard about OFAC, which is O-F-A-C. It is the Office of Foreign Assets Control. That is a very small uh, agency within the U.S. Department of the Treasury. When I say very small, I mean this is an agency that probably has maybe 100 people in it altogether, of lawyers, uh, licensing officers, enforcement people. So it's not a lot of people, but they have a really significant impact on businesses. And they can impose civil penalties that can really, um, you know, be huge civil penalties against your business. And if they think that you've intentionally violated economic sanctions, they can refer your company for criminal prosecution to the Justice Department. So they may be small, but they are very mighty in terms of the effect that they can have on your business. Um, we're also going to be talking about export controls. Um, these are controls on products and technology and equipment and technical data that go outside the United States. And then, as Ella mentioned, we're going to be talking about CFIUS and restrictions on foreign direct investment into the United States, into foreign, into U.S. companies, particularly in the life sciences and biotech sector. So first on economic sanctions, we're just very briefly, we're going to talk about the relevant agencies and what these sanctions are and why you should care about them. Um, I've already mentioned OFAC, but you'll also hear people talk about the Commerce Department and the Bureau of Industry and Security, or BIS. Um, that's another agency in the U.S. government that can impose things that look a lot like economic sanctions. Um, you've probably heard uh, a lot of Chinese companies have been put on something called the Entity List, which operates a lot like an economic sanctions list. The Department of State has um, a, a number of lists that operate like sanctions lists. Sanctions lists are really lists of prohibited um, parties, individuals and companies that your company as a US company or even as a non-US company um, are restricted or prohibited from doing business with. So you need to know who these companies are, who these individuals are, and um, if you're a US company, it's pretty easy what the rules are. You can't do business with them. If you're a foreign company, if you're a non-US company, that it's a little bit more complicated. You may not be prohibited from doing business with these companies or these individuals, but if you do, then you may be foreclosing off your access to the US financial markets or to US investors or to the US market or US exports. So there could be consequences for you to uh, deal with these companies or these entities, even if you're not a US person or a US company. Um, in addition to the US list, there's UN lists, there's the EU list, um, there's Hong Kong list, there's the UK list. So you can see why it can get really complicated um, for any company to try to keep up with all of these different lists. Um, the OFAC uh, list is called the SDN list, the Specially Designated Nationals list, SDN. And that list all by itself has thousands and thousands of names on it. And so it can be very complicated 
um, for any, you know, for a company to try to keep up with all of the changes on that list and who is on it. Um, and so, uh, um, you know, most companies will rely on third party vendors to try to manage their screening obligations. Uh, but we'll talk a little bit uh, later about how you can get in trouble even doing that because you may be relying on them to, and they may be screening lists that you, you're not really subject to. They may be over-inclusive. Um, what are the rules when we're talking about sanctions? Well, the, um, actually, you know, I start with U.S. statutes because that's, that's, you know, those are the statutes that Congress passed that impose sanctions rules. But actually, it starts actually with the U.S. Constitution, because um, some of the um, sanctions are they have general license or they have exceptions for First Amendment protected activity. So the U.S. Constitution has a First Amendment, which provides for freedom of speech. And pursuant to that, even though OFAC may want to regulate the provision of information or freedom of speech, um, they, uh, you know, there, there are limits to what they can do. And actually, uh, some of that, some of those court cases that you may have heard about with TikTok and WeChat, the reason, one of the reasons that those cases were successful um, when they were challenged, the, some of the plaintiffs challenged the Trump administration's imposition of sanctions against WeChat and TikTok some of the arguments were based on the First Amendment. They said, you know, you are infringing on the First Amendment protections of WeChat or TikTok users for the free expression of their ideas. And so it's not, it's not a completely crazy thought to think that sanctions are, um, you know, some of, they are limited. There, is, there are limits, um, even though we, we typically don't think there's any limits to what OFAC or the president can do with respect to sanctions. Actually, there are. There are some limits. Um, so we start with the Constitution, but then Congress will pass statutes. And the, the you know, two main statutes in these areas are called the Trading with the Enemies Act the Enemy Act, which covers Cuba and North Korea. And then all the other sanctions programs are grounded in what's called IEPA, um, the International Emergency Economic Powers Act. And that covers the sanctions related to Russia and Iran, Syria, um, all the other sanctions programs besides Korea, um, North Korea and Cuba. It used to be that those were the only two laws that you really had to worry about. But since that, since IEPA was passed, there have been a number of statutes that have been passed um, by Congress specific to certain countries or regions or activities. And so it seems like every congressional session, we have Congress passing more and more statutes um, that, that try to directly tell the president whether it's a Republican president or a Democratic president telling the president what to do. You know, we don't like what this country is doing. So, Mr. President, you need to do this with respect. You need to take action with respect to sanctions against this country. So we're seeing we've seen that with respect to, you know, with China, with the, you know, Uyghurs or with Hong Kong, with uh, Syria, with Iran. There's so many examples of statutes that Congress has passed that have been directed at particular countries. Um, those are implemented by the, the, the president through executive orders, um, directives by OFAC, and OFAC also publishes formal guidance and interpretations and frequently asked questions. Lots and lots of information and materials. Each sanctions program is different. They have their own laws, they have their own set of regulations, their own set of FAQs. It's really super complicated. It's good for us lawyers because it keeps us employed. You know, we have to keep up with all of the complexity. But for the, you know, for people who are just trying to do business, it can be really complicated for, for people to keep up with what all of the changes are. That's just the US side, you know, as I note on this slide, um, most companies these days are doing business internationally. So you also have to keep up with, you know, what are the European rules? 
what's going on in Canada, the UK, what's happening in Singapore. And now we're seeing that there's some really significant legislation passed in China that is aimed to counter, counteract the effects of foreign sanctions laws. So it's really putting um, a lot of companies in a very difficult position because they may be told by one country, you, you have to act in a certain way. And by China or by Canada or by the EU, you know, no, you have to act in a completely different way. So it, it's becoming a, a much more complex world that we're living in. Um, so these are the types of sanctions that, that you know, that we're facing. Um, and when we talk about embargoes, we're really talking about you know, the complete, almost, there's almost nothing you can do with respect to these countries. They're really almost a blanket prohibition against the entire country or the region, if we're talking about Crimea. So these embargoes, we call them comprehensive sanctions, Cuba, Iran, North Korea, Syria, and the Crimean region. And when Crimea came up, it became very difficult for a lot of countries, a lot of companies, because Crimea is not a country. <laughs> and so, you know, how do you as a company try to implement a sanctions compliance program when you're dealing with just part of a country that's a region? How do you identify that? What's in Crimea versus not in Crimea versus, you know, what's in the rest of Ukraine? Um, but these are comprehensive sanctions. There's very little that a US company can do in these countries without specific authorization from the US government. You can do some things, especially in your sector. You, you guys are operating in a really good business sector because to the extent you're allowed to do stuff in these countries, you guys are the ones that are allowed to do it. You know, the sale of food, agricultural products, medicines and medical devices are allowed in these countries, but you have to jump through hoops. Doesn't mean that you can just go ahead and sell anything you want to to Cuba and Iran and North Korea. You might have to apply for a license. You might have to get your particular medical device or technology classified by the government. But um, you, should, you should understand that with respect to these countries, you will need to really look at each particular country. What are the things that I need to do to get authorization to, to do business in these countries? Um, besides those kind of comprehensive embargoes, again, we have more targeted sanctions. We call them smart sanctions because they're smart because they're not just totally, you know, uh, against the whole country. We're not trying to target an entire country. We're trying to really pinpoint who are the companies, the entities, the activities that we're really trying to target, the, the drug traffickers, the nuclear proliferators, the the terrorism financiers, you know. So these are the, the prohibited parties or activities. Um, and, you know, this also is a good time for me to, to, you know, explain that yes, you know, as a company, you want to stay on the right side of the law. You don't want to get a civil penalty. You certainly don't want to be referred to the Justice Department for criminal prosecution. But um, in this area of the law, uh, these are all based on national security concerns. And so in addition to not wanting to get a penalty, you don't really want the reputational damage. The reason these people are on a prohibited list is because they're bad guys, right? These are generally, you know, not people you really want to do business with. And so that's another reason most of our clients are eager to make sure that they comply with these sanctions. Yes, they don't want to get a penalty. They don't, nobody wants to go to jail, but also they don't want to end up in the newspaper or on the internet, you know, saying that this company, you know, sold, you know, medicines to, or not medicines, but, you know, sold some technology to the Iran Revolutionary Guard Corps or to, you know, a terrorism, a financier or to a drug uh, kingpin. So that's, that's another reason why. Um, the only other thing I'll say on this slide, secondary sanctions are, are just another way that the US tries to extend its law extraterritorially, tries to, to force non-US companies 
to really comply with US law. It's, it's not really often used. Um, it's really a way for the US to say, if you're going to engage in a significant uh, transaction with a really, uh, you know, a, a bad actor, we're gonna try to impose penalties on you, even if you're not a US company, or even if you have no really connection to the US. That rarely happens, and it certainly doesn't happen for guys, you know, for companies in your area. So we're, we won't talk about that very much. But I do want to talk about this 50% rule, which is at the bottom of the slide. What does that mean? Um, well, we've talked about the list, you know, with the thousands of people and the thousands of companies. That sounds hard enough to try to deal with. But the other thing you need to know is that you can also be penalized for dealing with a company that's not even on the list if they're owned by a company that's on the list. So um, OFAC expects you not only to not do business with companies on the list, they expect you not to do business with companies that are owned 50% or more by companies on the list even if those companies are not even on the list. So it's called the 50% rule. It's very difficult uh, for, for people to comply with, um, but it is, it is something that you need to be aware of. It's, it's out there, OPEC will consider it, you know, an obligation on your part to know who you're dealing with and the owners of the business that you're dealing with. And if you're dealing with ABC company and they're not on the list and they look like a good company, but if you had done your diligence and you and that would have shown you that they are owned by a really notorious SDN, um, OFAC is gonna give you a civil penalty for dealing with that company. So, okay, we've already talked about this. These are the embargoes, the, you know, the complete uh, transactions or complete uh, prohibitions on all transactions. And we've talked about the prohibited parties and the list. Um, so let's talk about you guys in particular. So again, um, of all the clients that we deal with, and we deal with a lot of clients in the, you know, the technology sector, you know, semiconductors, defense, internet, um, you know, communications. I love working with companies in biotech and life science because you are kind of in the sweet spot when it comes not only to, to sanctions, but also to export controls because um, pursuant to an actual statute that Congress passed called the Trade Sanctions Relief Act or Reform Act, um, OFAC is supposed to uh, be very generous in giving authorization for US companies to export, to engage in transactions, to give, to export medicines, medical devices, and uh, medical uh, technologies to sanctioned jurisdictions. Um, and so, you know, if you are going to need to go to OFAC for authorization to engage in a transaction, it's really good to be in a life sciences company because you, you guys have a much better chance of getting, um, you know, getting authorization. Um, and, and I've noted in this slide in response to COVID, um, OFAC has, you know, issued guidance expressly stating, look, you know, we're in a pandemic, uh, please come to us if you guys need authorization to, you know, engage in transactions that will help with this pandemic. We stand ready and, you know, we are able, you know, we want to help uh, in any way we can to facilitate the export of, you know, materials or anything that will assist in the pandemic. I think it came early on in the pandemic when there was a lot of suffering in Iran, for example, um, and there was some concern that, you know, basic medical supplies. We, we're not even talking like COVID, like, um, you know, protective uh, equipment that were, was being hoarded. We're talking basic med medical supplies. We're not reaching um, Iran. Um, and people were saying, oh, it's because of OFAC sanctions. And um, there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of criticism of the U.S. government because of that. So OFAC came out with guidance saying, please come to us. We are, you know, in your sector, we are very willing to provide authorization. I'm just checking the chat to make sure I'm not catching any questions. Um, so I wanted to give you an example of how we have done, we have um, worked with companies 
in the life sciences sector with OFAC, for example. Um, we had a client that provided um, uh, adverse event reporting. Um, they had a customized business process uh, providing digital support services to a large number of pharmaceutical and device makers to um, assist in adverse event reporting. And in order to, um, you know, to be successful, and these related to vaccines and respirators in particular, and you can see some of the, you know, very large uh, customers that our client was working with. So they came to Gibson, they said, look, we, you know, we need to have global uh, reporting of this, um, including, uh, you know, some of these comprehensive embargo jurisdictions. And, um, you know, we, they were concerned that, you know, there, there's an exemption for the export of medicines and medical devices, but we're not sure whether th these types of business process and digital support services um, falls within that medical, you know, export of medicines and devices. Um, it's certainly related to that, but it, you know, it doesn't seem to neatly fit within the, the, the limits of the, that exemption. And so, you know, we took a look at it and we agreed it doesn't really kind of fit squarely within um, that existing exemption. And so we wrote into OFAC and said, you know, this is what our client does. This is what they need to do to have a successful, you know, to collect this information and have a successful, um, you know, adverse event reporting system. And they need to, to you know, to get this information from um, embargo jurisdictions. Um, and we need to have a specific license. Um, uh, and we'll talk about, you know, what a specific license. We need authority from OFAC to do this. And um, it took three and a half months, and that is quick by OFAC standards. But they received a very broad license. And it basically said, under all of the comprehensive programs, you can provide this type of, of support. And um, because it got this sweeping license, it was specific to this one particular client and didn't apply to the competitors. You know, they were very happy with that. And it's just an example of, you know, how you can go to OFAC when, when especially, you know, when, when technology changes and the use and application of technologies change, the government regulations are not going to keep up with that. And they're not, you're not going to be able to you know, take a look at that all the time and see, oh, it's, it's exactly tracking new developments and new technologies. You will have to go to the government sometimes and ask for authorization and it is possible to get it. So this is a success story. This is a good story. And um, I think it's because of the, the uh, sector that you're in, the business sector that you're in. So let's talk about export controls. Um, what you need to know about export controls is that they are very broad um, on the US side. A lot of our allies complain about how extensive our US export controls are. They apply to any US origin product or technology. It doesn't matter where in the world it is or where it travels to. If it, was, if it originated in the US, then it, it follows the product. So if it's of US origin, uh, you know, it, obviously the export of it is controlled, but also the re-export. When we talk about transfer, that means in-country transfer. So if I export something to Ella and she's in Germany, and then Ella transfers it to uh, a, you know, a friend of hers who's also in Germany, that transfer within Germany is subject to control by the US government because it follows the product, you know, no matter where it goes. Once US jurisdiction attaches because it is um, a US product, it never lets go. It's always, so it, it applies to me, it applies to Ella because she has possession of it. Um, it attaches to, you know, the commodities, the technology, software, it's just extremely broad. So that's the bad news. Um, this is just another slide explaining, you know, that it, it, it controls, you know, anybody who is touching the technology or the goods that are, in, uh, that, that are controlled, it um, controls the exports, the re-exports, or the transfers. It 
controls the things, the information, the software, the services, all of these things are controlled. Now that's the bad news. The good news is that in your particular bio, pharmaceutical, life sciences sector, most of the stuff that you do is safe in terms of they're not controlled in terms of needing a license. Um, you shouldn't you shouldn't think that they're not controlled at all. They are they're, they're subject to U.S. jurisdiction, but they're not requiring a license. They're not controlled for export by by needing a license. So most of your technologies that you work with in this area, we have just we have it's our experience uh, for your companies in the biopharmaceutical life sciences your um, technologies are generally not controlled, um, except if you're dealing with certain pathogens, uh, Botox, uh, toxins, things that might be used in chemical or biological warfare applications, those will be controlled. Um, certain genetic elements or genetically modified organisms could be controlled, and also some equipment that you use could be controlled. So if you're using some very sophisticated testing equipment and you want to export that equipment, you need to look at that very carefully because the testing equipment um, or the uh, manufacturing equipment, that could be controlled. But generally speaking, again, the good news is that for people in your sector, um, you're not going to be subject to the types of controls that we see in you know, semiconductors, energy, nuclear, materials processing, the other types of clients that we deal with. Um, again, think about equipment too, because that's another area where we see um, that, you know, a lot of, of, of companies in this space will only be looking at their, you know, biotech, you know, uh, pharmaceutical technology, but they will be also looking at their equipment. That becomes important. Maybe you're saying, well, I'm not going to export my equipment, so I don't care. I'm in the U.S. and I've got this equipment. I'm not going to be exporting the equipment. But if you're going to be ever thinking about, about soliciting foreign investment, it's critical that you look at the export classification of your equipment because that could really influence who is able to, inf to invest in your company. So we'll talk about that. So here's another case study. <laughs> we had a, um, this is a great example. We had a publicly traded biopharmacology company that was in the United States. It also had a sister company in China. And here's a description of what they were doing with respect to the development of cell therapies for the treatment of cancers and um, degenerative diseases. Um, they were thinking about either soliciting uh, investment from US and foreign sources, or perhaps going private. Um, for both of those engagements, um, we needed to take a look at Sufi's issues, which we are going to be talking about separately. Um, but uh, it, in order to prepare for that, to prepare for solicitation of investors, um, we had to do a very thorough export control review of their technologies, of their equipment, of their technical data, because we had to assure the investors, number, for two reasons. Number one, we had to assure the investors that they were investing in a company that was not a walking export control violation. Nobody wants to invest in a company and then turn around and have that company be subject to a massive export investigation and subject to huge fines, right? You just want to make sure that you're investing in a good company. So we wanted to establish for these investors, hey, you know, we, we've done this compliance review, they're good. The second reason we wanted to do a, an export compliance review was to, um, to show them, look, these are the, the things that are classified. These are the, how the technologies, the equipment are classified. So for CFIUS purposes, you as a Chinese investor are allowed to invest in this company. Um, first of all, you're allowed to, this is not an ITAR company. This is not a company that US law prohibits Chinese investment into. And secondly, even if it's allowed, 
This is not the type of company that the US government is going to say no. It may be technically allowed, but for national security purposes, we don't want to have Chinese investment in this company. We could show them that the technologies and the equipment of this company were not critical technologies, were not the type of export control technologies that the US government was worried about. And we did all of that work upfront so that when the client went on their roadshow and they're, they're going private transaction, all of that work was done and they were able to secure the best, they were put in the best position to get like the best return on that, all of that work. So that's a, a good example. So let's talk a little bit about CFIUS. I kind of saved the best for last. <laughs> what, what is CFIUS? CFIUS is the Committee on Foreign Investment in the US. It's an interagency committee. Lots of different agencies are involved. I've listed some of them here. Um, CFIUS has been in the news a lot. Um, and obviously under the Trump administration, there have been a, you know, there's, there was a lot of tension with respect to CFIUS and China. Uh, but I, I tell clients that, you know, the, the Trump administration didn't start the tension with China and CFIUS. Um, and it didn't end with the Trump administration. You'll notice that those 301 tariffs that Trump put in, they're still, they're still there. You know? Biden hasn't like unilaterally withdrawn those tariffs. And so, um, and the way I explain it to, to clients is, you know, China is just fascinating. You know, I've always been fascinated by China for you know ever, and I told Ella I I spent uh, you know a year studying Chinese in college. What did you learn? The book ha, and maybe she. I used to what did you learn? Try try again la. Um, try bu la, try bu la. Oh, I'm about to. Um, but but the reason it's fascinating from an international law perspective is that it's the only country where we have two, at the same time, these two aspects. The first aspect is that we are immensely engaged economically with China and Chinese companies. There's no other country in the world where, where there's more enthusiasm for, for US companies and Chinese companies to get together, to collaborate, to share information and technologies. There's so much excitement and enthusiasm and engagement and collaboration. You know, that's not unusual. We have the same thing with Canada, with Europe, with the UK. Okay, that's that's the one side. The other side is, you know, we rightly or wrongly view China as a, as a threat, a military threat, you know, as, as a, you know, as, as a competitive military threat. Um, that's not unusual either. You know, we have the same thing with Russia. We have the same thing with other countries. We, you know, as an adversarial military type, you know, uh, threat. But we know we, there's no one other country where we have the same two things together. You know, we, there's no one other country where we have active economic collaboration and engagement, and at the same time, we view them as a military threat. There's no, this is the only country in the world where we have this very unique, you know, very, um, I don't know, bifurcated, just, you know, push me, pull you engagement with this country. And that's why we have this, you know, very active cities docket. Um, you know, where we really want, you know, we encourage foreign direct investment, but we're so worried about, you know, what are the implications for some technologies to go to China? Um, and so that's, you know, that's why we have this very interesting and long standing. It, it predated Trump, it's, it's after Trump, and it's just, you know, it's just a, a, a very long standing um, factor in our relationship. So that's why it's been in the news lately. It's going to be in the news for a while. So historically, CFIUS has been concerned about, you know, stuff that's not in your bailiwick. It's been concerned about critical infrastructure, um, semiconductors, communications, defense. I mean, that's really been, you know, kind of the, the things that CFIUS has been most concerned about. But recently, and especially with new legislation, it has really started to look at areas like, you know, personally identifiable information and critical technologies that don't necessarily relate to defense. You know, what are critical new technologies that we need to be worried about? Um, obviously, China has been 
you know, in the crosshairs with CFIUS for a long time. China is not the only country of concern. I don't want to, I don't want to, um, you know, to 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 suggest that it is. It keeps coming up because. We do a heck of a lot more business with China than we do with North Korea or with some of the other countries, Sudan, that we have you know, similar concerns about. Um, people are not clamoring to do like huge projects with companies in Syria right now, you know, but there is an enormous enthusiasm still for collaborating with Chinese companies. Um, there have been, I mentioned like new CFIUS rules that came into effect. Um, and two of them, I think, are of interest to um, companies in your sector. Uh, critical technologies um, that, uh, and uh, you know, companies in the US that produce, design, test, manufacture, fabric, fabricate, or develop critical technologies. That's defined by their export control classification. And so that's why it was really important for us when we were working with that, um, uh, that uh, previous client to go and classify all of their um, technologies and equipment for export control purposes. So we could assure their investors and we can assure the CFIUS they don't deal with critical technology. The only way you can make that assurance is by reviewing the export classification of what you're dealing with. Um, and the other thing to think about is, you know, sensitive personal data um, does include genetic data of US citizens. Now, the good news is that CFIUS is only concerned about companies that hold lar really large amounts of sensitive personal data. Usually at least the, the sensitive personal data, including genetic data, could also be location data of at least a million US individuals. So most companies in this space don't have access to that many individuals. It has to be personally identifiable, not some randomized, anonymized data. It has to be something that could be particular, particularly identified to individuals. And you know, why is that? Because Sifis is worried about, you know, people being blackmailed, people being, you know, that information being used against individuals. And if it lands in the hands of a foreign adversary, then you know that, that could potentially be used. There is a, um, a very fun, I think it's funny, a very funny um, a CFIUS case involving Tinder. I think it was Tinder, you know, the gay dating app location and it was um, acquired or there's a significant investment by a, um, uh, a Chinese related company, a Chinese company. And it was forced to divest that app because there was obviously more than a million users on Tinder. And, you know, there was personally identifiable information and probably a lot of information about the Tinder users, but because, and that was the reason that people were worried that they could be blackmailed or they could be, you know, whatever. But, but you know, normally you wouldn't consider a dating app to be something of national security concern to the United States, but because of this particular provision in FIRMA, it was captured. And you can see how the definition of national security keeps getting bigger and bigger. You know, not now it's not just defense and missiles and you know telecommunications infrastructure. It's, you know, what are the personal financial records of a million Americans or the genetic information of a million Americans? So, so I just have um I just have a few more minutes. So I just have a, uh, oh, let me talk first about just COVID-19 implications. You know, obviously we're in the, the midst of pandemic and uh, uh, we think that, you know, when, if you're thinking about any type of foreign investment in the biotech sector, it's important to think about CFIUS, do a CFIUS risk assessment. Um, uh, you know, the, the pandemic has obviously heightened everybody's concern about what is a, you know, what, what, is, what could be considered a national security interest. So even if you don't have critical technologies, that doesn't mean that CFIUS can't still look at your transaction. That just means that it's not a mandatory filing. You know, CFIUS can look at anything that they want to. I, I don't mean to suggest that you have to have a critical technology, but, um, you know, it goes a long way to, to tell them that you don't have a critical technology, 
But um, it's uh, that, that's very important to demonstrate you don't have a critical technology. But even if you don't, cities can look at any transaction. Um, they do still have to decide whether there's a national security threat. Um, but I just wanted to remind people about this CureVac case of March 2020. I don't know if people remember this, but the Trump administration, <laughs> there was a rumor that the Trump administration wanted to buy this German company that was working on a coronavirus <laughs> vaccine. And that the rumor was that the, the Trump administration wanted to buy it, buy the firm in Germany that was working on this breakthrough coronavirus vaccine, bring it to the United States and only use the vaccine on Americans. And of course, um, they denied it. Of course, this is not true. And then later, later, you know, Germ the German government confirmed that it was true. There were overtures by the US government to buy this German company, you know, and bring it back to the US. So there's, it's kind of a reverse CFIUS. Um, situation, but these are a couple of headlines from newspapers of that day back in March of 2020. So, okay, so case study Exobionics in May of 2020. This was a, and I have just enough time for this to get a US manufacturer of exoskeletons, um, was told by CFIUS to terminate a joint venture that it had with Chinese partners. So um, this was a joint venture that it had set up a couple of years before, so 2017. And when it set up the joint venture in 2017, it didn't, um, it didn't tell Sifius about it because a joint venture at that time, and even now really, it's not subject to Sifius jurisdiction. So there's no reason for them to tell Sifius. So of course it was pretty strange for Sifius to, um, uh, call up Exobionics and tell them to terminate this joint venture, but they did, they did. And so, um, uh, so this, was, this was pretty surprising. Why did they do that? Well, why did Sifius care? Why did Sifius care that this, you know, Bionics company, um, you know, had set up this joint venture? Well, they, they had shifted their focus to the to medicine, um, but prior to that, they did have a history, this US company had a history of working with the US military um, products that involve exoskeletons. If you look back at the previous slide, doesn't that thing look like like from that Aliens movie? Remember that Aliens movie where, um, where that woman like was battling the alien and that exoskeleton? Um, so they had a history of working with the US military and uh, uh, apparently we're working on some exoskeletons that would allow military personnel to, to use these things to carry heavy objects. Or was that Avatar? It might've been Avatar. Um, anyway, so then they switched over to, you know, working with, um, you know, uh, paralysis victims and, and things like that in the medical field. So this was an application, this was a technology that had different applications. It had commercial applications, medical applications, but it also had um, you know, had military applications. And so that's why SIFI has cared about this, but why did EXO comply with the instructions to terminate? Um, you know, at the time, a lot of lawyers were like, SIFI has no jurisdiction to tell a US company to terminate what it's doing in China. It's not a control transaction. I mean, I don't want to get into all the legal legalese, but it, it doesn't fall within Sifius's jurisdiction. I just wanted to, you know, to put this slide up to show how much pressure the U.S. government can bring to bear on a U.S. company. It didn't matter that Sifius doesn't technically have jurisdiction. Um, you know, exporting is a privilege, and if EXO had not, um, had not complied with this demand by the US government, it basically could have its whole business shut down. You know, it could have had its exporting privileges stopped. It could have had its importing privileges stopped. It could have had, it could have been put on the FDA. It could, there, there's so much the US government could have done to this company legally, quite legally to just basically shut off its international business that they really had no choice, even though as a lawyer, I could look at it and say Sifius really didn't have a basis to do anything. I just have a couple more case studies before we stop. Um, right dose, this would happen in July of 2020. Um, it was reported that it, was, it has signed a contract with the Defense Logistics Agency of the US government. 
to um, to supply pre-filled syringes with vaccines to um, to combat COVID. Uh, the report, you know, the newspaper reported this. Somebody said, "Hey, I remember that." You know, right just back in 2017 had been acquired by a consortium of Hong Kong and Chinese based investors. You know what, you know, you should look into this. And CFIUS did look into this. So the lesson here is that CFIUS can look into things well that happened well before, you know, they can look at a transaction that happened in 2017. They can look at it in 2020. Um, the reason that people go through the CFIUS process and get cleared is so that you get the safe harbor. If you don't go through CFIUS, if you don't get cleared, then you never get the safe harbor and CFIUS can always look back. It's called a non-notified transaction. You don't notify CFIUS of your transaction. They can always go back and look at it. Um, the CFIUS process is very confidential. So we don't know what happened with this review. They did review it. And apparently they, you know, nothing else was reported. So it looks like they were satisfied that nothing untoward happened. But this can be very, very disruptive. <laughs> Obviously this company was very happy and successful and had signed a big contract with the US government. And then I don't know what happened, a, a disgruntled competitor, you know, tapped the US government on the shoulder and said, guess what happened, you know, three years ago? You know, they, they got Chinese money three years ago, and then all of a sudden there's a huge investigation. So this can happen. Another, uh, another study, uh, another case study, Patients Like Me um, had received a, uh, an investment uh, from a Chinese-based company. This was a, um, a, a US company that provided a, a social media style platform for patients to share information to share information about you know they voluntarily share their own information uh, about what medicines they were taking their lifestyle habits their treatments they were supposed to you know use the the social platform was supposed to use artificial intelligence to help pharmaceutical companies and governments to study medical conditions and develop treatments um, the Trump administration, now this was back in 2017, that they received this really large investment from a Chinese company. Uh, the Trump administration, two years later, um, decided that this was not, um, not good. And again, this is because of the genetically, the personal identifiable health information uh, about presumably more than a million subscribers to patients like me. And they, uh, they uh, forced, they told the, um, the company that you need to divest the Chinese part of your company, the Chinese investment. So it's basically a fire sale of the Chinese investment, which as you can imagine, you know, it doesn't really um, do a lot of good things to the value of a company like patients like me, when they have to dump a million dollar investment to an approved American buyer. They can't sell it to it. You know, they can't solicit investments from another Chinese investor. It has to be somebody that the Trump administration would approve, which you would assume would be a US approved investor. Um, if you were a US approved investor, I'm sure you could get a million dollar interest in patients like me for a lot less than a hundred million dollars. So uh, unfortunately they lost a lot of value. Okay, I wanted to, to end with a positive story. <laughs> this is just from, uh, from last month. Um, there, was an there is an Italian um, diagnostic company that, uh, that had some Chinese investment. They have some Chinese investment that acquired a uh, American medical test maker, Luminex Corporation, uh, was reviewed by CFIUS because of the Chinese uh, investment in the Italian company. This, this just shows you that you can have an Italian company acquiring an American company and it can be reviewed by CFIUS because of the presence of Chinese investment in the Italian company. And uh, there was a concern that, hey, you know, the American company, the medical test maker has a lot of technology and data that could be accessed not only by the Chinese investor, but you'll see guys that there's this paranoia in Washington fueled I think by certain members of Congress 
that any Chinese company equals the Chinese government. So if a Chinese company has access to any kind of data or technology, that means that the Chinese government has access to that technology and data. Um, I don't necessarily think that's true, but that's the, the, you know, the trend going around in Washington right now. Uh, but the, uh, the, the happy ending to the story is that the um, CFIUS review process went through and the company was cleared by CFIUS and they were approved by CFIUS. So it's a happy ending for um, Diasorin, but also that means that Diasorin doesn't have to worry. They don't have to worry that, you know, in 2024, CFIUS is gonna look back at this transaction. They have cleared, they've been reviewed by CFIUS, they've been cleared. And unless CFIUS can show that they made any kind of misrepresentation, they're fine. They cannot be reviewed again about that particular transaction. So they have earned the safeguard of the CFIUS process. So I think that is my last slide. Um, I think we have one question to help with the, oh, we have a couple questions. To help with the budget process, how much legal fees? Oh, okay, that's a really good question. Um, so for the, for the budget process, um, let me see for the, the two cases that I mentioned, for going to OFAC and getting the license application for that one company, um, I would say it was, pro I, the range I would say would be like 30 to $50,000 to do that. That was, that's probably a good estimate for, you know, consulting with the client, drafting the application. It's not a, you know, it's not just a one page application like, you know, here is what we want to do. Please give us authority. We draft an application and we tell OFAC why they should grant the authority. Why is it in the national interest of the U.S. for you to grant this authority? Why should you exercise your discretion to grant the authority? And we give all the case history and all of the prior precedent that we know about. And in that case, we were really lucky, we were really happy because we got a comprehensive worldwide license to, to go ahead and, and do that. For the second case where we oh, so actually give, did... sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt, if I could also uh, uh, just follow a question for this one. Um, are we talking about, for instance, like say a CFIUS analysis report uh, uh, for investor, for instance, for each deal that we want some help and also some review from lawyers that we need to um, have lawyer to issue some report and the cost is probably a couple of thousands of dollars. Are we talking about the same thing or is this like a different from, from startup perspective versus the investor's perspective? Yeah, so for the second case, Ella, that was the case where we reviewed the technology and the equipment for the company so that we could prepare an opinion about their export controls for their investors. So that was not a startup. That was a very you know, sophisticated um, company. We had, they had operations in China and in the US. So we went to both locations. So we traveled to Shanghai and saw their equipment there. We saw their equipment in the US and that was about a $60,000. That was a, that was a a substantial thing. Um, we've also done some work for some uh, more startup companies, and especially during the pandemic where we did not travel, where we did phone conversations and Zoom conversations, where it was much less. It would be the five to $10,000 review, especially when it was a, a relatively narrow um, set of technologies and equipment that they did. Um, so that was, um, you know, so, so it, it can vary. It depends on how extensive the operations are, what locations that you're doing, uh, that you're operating in, um, and, uh, and, you know, how many, how many pieces of equipment you're, you're working with um, and, and how complicated it is. Is it something that we feel confident that we can self-classify or do we feel that in order to get a firm you know, firm result, we have to go to the Commerce Department and get a ruling from them. So, you know, the first example was going to OFAC to get a license. The second was for, you know, an opinion from a law firm. 
Now, you know, going the third, the third example, going through the whole CFIUS process, that's really expensive. You want to try to avoid that if you can. So it's much better to try to avoid the CFIUS process by getting all this export control information together because you know, Ella, the, the CFIUS process can take nine months, six to nine months. It can cost $100,000. It's very, very expensive and time consuming. So you want to try to avoid that if you can. Okay, so that was a good, that was a good question. What was, um, how long does the overall review process usually take? And what triggers it? So, um, the the uh, on, under the law, it is only supposed to take a maximum of um, ninety days. <laughs> and I laugh about that because it never takes ninety days. Um, you know, we track these things from from the very beginning when the parties decide to do a CFIUS filing. It takes a long time to get the filing prepared. It's a joint filing, both the buyer and the, the target and the investor jointly make a filing together. And then you submit it to CFIUS and they look at it for a while and they may send it back and then they look at it for a while and then they officially accept it. And that starts the official statutory time. Um, and so even though statutorily it may only take it, it may, it's supposed to only take 90 days, 45 days for a review and 45 days for an investigation. It, it usually takes, we usually tell people to expect at least six months. So, so Judith, can you say this, for instance, um, as an investor, uh, when we look at a deal and uh, if it's uh, really considered by our lawyer, um, to be failed as to, 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 to do a voluntary failing, then probably a lawyer would uh, recommend the investor recommend us, hey, probably that's not a really deal worth your time. Probably you can consider drop it. But for the startup, would you recommend doing the same thing? For instance, if they're raising money and if the company after the analysis, they were told by the lawyer, hey, it's very likely you would fall into this sensitive or critical technology category. And then if you're gonna take money from Chinese investor, you'll probably end up by failing this, like to do this voluntary failing. Then do you really think it, it worth them to do it? Where you would just say, hey, just uh, probably doesn't worth the time. Is there any tips you want to give to the, or recommendation you want to give to the startup? So I think if you were to do the expert control analysis and it turns out that you have critical technology, that means, Ella, that you need to, you need to do a CFIUS filing. It's mandatory. You, you don't have the option of not doing a CFIUS filing. Um, you really need to look at whether it's worth it to do a CFIUS filing. I would probably say in most cases, it's probably not worth it to accept the, you know, to accept the Chinese investment because it's so expensive and so time consuming to, as a startup, to accept the Chinese money and to go through the CFIUS filing. And it is still very hostile. I mean, I have to be honest with you, even though we're in the Biden administration and not the Trump administration, you know, it would be very difficult to get a, uh, a CFIUS approval for a Chinese company to acquire a U.S. company if that U.S. company has critical technologies. It would be very difficult to, to get that approved. So I think in most cases, it probably would not be worth it to do that. But you can only get to that decision point if you classify your technologies and your equipment. And as I said in the beginning, in your space, it's very rare that you would have that. It's only for pathogens. It's only for super expensive high-tech equipment that you know that it you know it would be very it would be very unlikely. It'd be very rare. Um, we, we've done this like for the the one company that we did the um, very extensive review in Shanghai and the US in multiple locations, they didn't have anything that was considered critical. And they had pretty sophisticated equipment, but it wasn't considered critical, you know, controlled for national security purposes under the Commerce Department regulations. Got it, got it. Yeah. Uh, and we have two more questions, or actually three more questions. Uh, so uh, one of that I think is a very typical and a good question how to prevent issues related to those issues you mentioned in the case study, or if you have Chinese investor in the company, you kind of like answer that, but 
Yeah, yeah. So if you have Chinese investors in the company, um, you know, I think it's um, if you already have Chinese investors in the U.S. company, there's really, you know, there's not much you, you need to do right now. Um, obviously, it's, you know, it's, um, as I said, like CFIUS can always, you know, come back and take a look at, at whatever investment happened in the past. But um, taking a look now at your um, at your equipment and technologies, it, 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 would, it might give you some comfort to know, hey, I'm not dealing with anything that's critical, that's critical technology. So even though I have Chinese investors, this is not going to be a problem for me going forward um, because, you know, I have Chinese investors, but this is not a critical technologies company. So it doesn't matter that I do. So, you know, at some point it might, it might be worth it for you to have an export control review. And also so that you know what you should avoid in the future. You know, I shouldn't go into this line or I shouldn't acquire this type of equipment. Or if I, I you know, start to develop these types of technologies, I might need to, you know, not accept future Chinese investment. So um, there was a question about uh, the, the Italian company, yes, it, it did. It, I don't know if it was completely owned by a Chinese investor, but it had significant Chinese investment. So yes, that's why. That's why Scipius was, in, was involved, yeah. So has anything changed with the process or the committee under the new presidential administration? Yes, um, not necessarily because of the new administration, but because there's been new legislation that has given CFIUS even more resources. So in particular, we have noticed they have more people out there investigating prior transactions that have not been notified to the committee. So we've had, within the past month, we've had three clients that have gotten requests, questionnaires from CFIUS about a prior transaction. And each one of those has involved a Chinese investment. Um, they haven't said you need to get you need to do a CFIUS filing. They haven't said that, but they've said we noticed that in 2019 you did this transaction with a Chinese investor. Please give us more information about that. And that happened in the past, but not nearly as often as it's happening right now. And it's because they've had more money from Congress under this new legislation, so they've hired more people to go out and look for these things. So. Unfortunately, it's um, they're out there looking, you know, and finding things to ask questions about. In other words, we don't expect this going to change in the short term. No, I don't think so. <laughs> no, no. No. And then, other than unwinding the transaction, what can trigger a criminal investigation? So, one thing I want to say: sometimes people will say that CFIUS can unwind a transaction. And I used to say that a lot too. The CFIUS will unwind a transaction. And that's really not true. They don't unwind it. They don't make the, the seller take back the, the uh, or the buyer take back the seller's money. Like that's not what happens. They just, um, the, they just make the, um, the, the uh, buyer like get rid of their interest. So if you're the seller in a CFIUS, or if you're the target, you, it doesn't affect you. It's the, if you're the Chinese investor, you have to divest your interest. It doesn't mean that you have to sell your interest back to the company. You just have to get rid of it. And so that's, um, you know, that's, that's a really, it puts you in a really poor position. Uh, what can trigger a criminal investigation anytime you give information to the U.S. government, either um, in a formal filing, in an email response, over the telephone, anytime you give information to the US government and that information is not correct, and they think that you intentionally gave them something that's not correct, that can trigger a criminal investigation. So you have to be really, really careful about, um, you know, about what information. I always tell people, you know, if you're not sure 100% sure, you know, just say I'm not 100% sure, or I'll have to get back to you, or I think the answer is this, but I'm not sure. You know, people are genuinely trying to be helpful, and so if the government asks a question, they, they give what they think is the right answer, but they don't, you know, a lot of times they don't really know, and so that can get you in trouble, because if, if it turns out that you're wrong, you know, then you have to prove that you weren't doing that on purpose, and 
that's called making a false statement. If they think that you were intentionally lying, then yes, you can get in trouble for that. So. Wonderful. And a uh, um, lawyer would always say, do not try to go around serious radio. That's going to be really the thing, put you in trouble. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Exactly. Perfect. Um, thank you so much, Judy. This is a, such a quite a valuable and also helpful session. Um, and I believe our audience will find that this section being extremely helpful. And for those who are interested to learn more, and especially for those who are in the process uh, talking with Chinese investor for some potential deal, and if you have any question, you can just contact with the Judy's. Um, so Judy's information should be in this uh, uh, event sprite. You can find or link in uh, and info and this account that you can easily find her. Um, so uh, Judy, if you want to give the last word. Yeah, so I just again want to thank you, Ella, and everybody for attending today. I just, I think this is such an exciting time. You know, you guys are, in addition to, you know, being a, a really great client base to work with, I just really, you know, it's an exciting area. Um, whenever I hear about the technologies, that companies are working on and you know the benefits that it can bring to so many people around the world. It's just so exciting. And so um, you know, anything that we can do here on the, you know, the legal side to assist in that is just it's just a really a, a big blessing for us. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak and I hope we get to work together sometime. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Have a great thank day. You. Bye bye.